Well, we're excited to be here with our guest. It's been a long time coming. We've just discussed actually, and he's joining us from Schenectady, New York, a beautiful part of the world. This is Kevin Barheit, and he has a book out called Dear Stephen Michael's Mother. It's a memoir. We're excited to talk to you. Welcome. Thanks. Great Welcome, to see you. Kevin. Thank you nice so much. Nice to have you here. So nice to have you here. So we'll we'll sort of just dig in and tell us your story, you know, how you want to tell it from the beginning and where you are now. Yeah, I was uh, I was born about uh, five minutes away from here in St. Clair's Hospital in Schenectady, in New York. But my biological mother, I never knew my birth mother, never knew who she was, where she was, anything about her. I was told, I think, some stories, you know, they just, I don't know if they make up the stories to make you feel better or just give you some semblance of connectivity to the world, that I, my mother was from 200 miles west of here, which actually she wasn't. She was uh, from Louisiana, from New Orleans, and as was my biological father, and I, I um, didn't know that uh, growing up. Uh, I spent most of my life here in Schenectady and then traveled around a bit when I was in the military and came back here. And uh, I lived in New York City for about 15 years. Uh, I have a quick question for you. 40s. How did you um, find out then? And were you adopted? Um, were there any other siblings that you had growing up or? Yeah. How did you find out that you were from New Orleans? That's the search that some of us get to go on. And mm -hmm. I was, uh, when I was adopted, I was adopted through Catholic Family Charities here in Schenectady. And the, I ended up in the newspaper, by the way, because they, uh, they were doing, the local paper was doing an interview with Catholic Charities um, the day that my parents, my, my adopted parents were picking me up. So they were interviewing and they said, yeah, this is a baby we're, we're doing today. And I ended up getting my picture in, in the paper. But after I was, um, placed with my, uh, I was in a foster care for a little while, but then after I was placed with my adoptive family, uh, my parents had not, my adoptive parents had not been able to have children. They um, could not conceive. Uh, so I didn't have any siblings uh, in that way and they never adopted any other. So I was, I was um, born and raised an only child. Mm -hmm. And I spent, like I said, most of my life not knowing anything about my family. And when I was in New York City, uh, I was working for a person named Roz Peer, and uh, we worked for together for two years at the Fashion Institute of Technology. And when I was leaving that job to come back up here for a different job, she said, Kevin, now that you're leaving, we have to go out for lunch. I need to talk to you. And I said, well, okay, that's wow. nice. She's going to take me out for lunch. And I didn't know what, but she looked at me with that very, she was a very serious person to begin with, but she <laughs> got a little extra serious and said, we have something in common. And, you know, she wouldn't tell me what it was, but I don't know, like many of us saying I was adopted was like saying, people would say, do you have any brothers or sisters? And I'd say, I don't know. I'm adopted. Mm -hmm. you know? It's just like and an kind of in a disconnect way, yeah. right? Like you're not connected that's, to it. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And it just comes out of your mouth and you, it's not flippantly, but it's, it's almost a throwaway line after a while. Mm -hmm. You just get used to trying yes. to just move on with the conversation in some other way. Yeah. She had heard that stored it away in her brain for two years, never said a word to me. We sat down for lunch and she told me that she was a birth mother and she had given away her twins, son and daughter. And the two of us had an experience that was somewhat, I think, uh, out of body experience for both of us because, um, you know, I had never actually sat down and spoken to someone who had been a birth mother, who had gone through that. But not only had she given away her children, but she had found them. Mm. And she had tried to reunite with them and it had not gone well at all. And she was in a lot of pain over that. And so I was in a similar amount of distress during this conversation. But the two of us had this real, I would say somewhat um, surrogate kind of relationship for a few minutes there for five or 10 minutes as we talked. And I more or less became her son and she more or less became my mother. And we talked to each other in ways that I don't think I ever could have conceived possible. Uh, and that's how I started my search. Uh, Roz supported me greatly and said, if you, she said, I know you're moving upstate. I know you've got a lot on your plate. I know you've got your family and your job, but if you're ever interested in searching, I'd be glad to help you. Wow. 
and she guided me and it took me two years. It's a long story, but I will wrap it up in 30 seconds or less here. It's a wonderful, uh, it was a journey, you know, like for many of us, but for me, I was uh, born in 1962. I was part of the baby scoop era. There was a, I was born in New York. There was a reason that people from Louisiana sent their children, you know, their, the unwed mothers to New York. The law that was a so question strict. I had. I'm glad you, yeah. yeah. The laws were so strict. The courts were so, you know, um, they weren't very lenient towards anyone that needed that information or wanted that information. And I'm not saying that it wasn't possible, but it was almost, it was virtually impossible to get your records, judges, lawyers, no matter oh, yeah. what you threw at it uh, until just a few years ago when it opened up a little bit. Uh, so my, my mother had come here. She had uh, lived with a family friend uh, that her, my grandparents knew. Uh, they were gambling buddies. And so they knew each other. They used to go to Louisiana to, you know, go on the river boats or whatever they do and gamble away. So my mother uh, came to live with them, uh, gave birth to me and promptly left. Yeah. And but how old was she? She was 20. 20? Yeah. She was 20 years old, 20 years old, unwed mother. Uh, she, uh, I found all this out later, of course. Um, mm -hmm. She had had an affair with a married man. Uh, that was my father. Uh, she had been, of course, caught by her, you know, my grandparents, uh, and shamed and sent away. Uh, she was also bipolar, had depression, had other issues. Mm -hmm. These are things that I've uncovered over the years, but finding her was quite a journey. I, I, it took me two years. From 2005 to 2007, mm -hmm. I searched piecemeal. I met other adoptees, other birth parents, search angels. Uh, I did my own digging. I spent time in the library going through old records. I called lawyers that were long dead. I tried to find files. I did everything I could. <clears throat> and the one place where I finally found some clues was, uh, again, Catholic Family Charities was where I was um, adopted uh, through. Uh, they had baptized me. And they had baptized me in a local church. So, you mean your birth mother had baptized you? We're not oh, sure who was there journeys. in the room. We're not sure who was there in the room. Oh, we really, I mean, there's just no way to know, right? There's no way to actually know. But there, you notice my name is Kevin John Barham. Kevin Barhite is my name. But the right. name of the book is Dear Stephen Michael's Mother. So the baptismal so, certificate had that name. So I called up, I did a lot of, this is the part that I could say, you know, sorry, sorry, Catholic people everywhere. I lied to <laughs> the people in the church Good. and I, Good yes, theater. right. I, I deceived them, but yes. I practiced actually. I called a small little church in the middle of the boonies and I had my, you know, hi, my name's Kevin Barheit. I'm doing a genealogy study. I was wondering if you could help me. And I had a few, a lot of truths and then a few little you know, um, stories that I told about why I was searching. And I told them I was searching for my father's, you know, um, ancestry and his dead brother. And I gave them a different name. And then I gave them finally the name Stephen Michael. I gave them a date. I gave them, you know, a time. And so I tried it with the small church and they looked at their records. And of course it wasn't the church. I really, this was just a trial. I said, sorry, we can't find anything. And then I tried one of the big dioceses, you know, and in, in Albany, New York, and they knew what I was doing. I mean, they, I could tell by the way they were on the phone. I'm sorry, sir, we cannot help you with that. And then I called, you know, the next day I said, this is it. This is do or die. I'm going to have one chance. And I called St. Madeline Sophie's church, which is a mid-sized church here in our area. And I, had practiced, of course, I had my dress rehearsals. And I think, to be honest with you, the woman, I think she knew what I was doing. I think she kind of knew, but I did it so well. And I was, you know, I think she played along or maybe she, you know, was convinced. Um, but an hour after I got off the phone with her, she called me back and she said, or, is this Kevin? And I said, yeah. She says, um, you, you and I just spoke. And I said, yeah. She said, well, um, I think I found what you're looking for, but um, I found two records. Your name's Kevin Barheit, right? She said, yeah. And I said, well, I found one for you that is in 1993. My parents had what? gone back to that church and rebaptized me. My adoptive oh. family, right? Because God forbid With you. Without you? Wait. Well, Without I, was, you? I don't oh. know. I'm guessing they took me there. They, but they, 1993, they... you were, you were. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Did I say 93? I meant 60. Yeah. Yes. Like, <laughs> you have consent. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, wait a second. 
<laughs> that was a good that was a good slip, wasn't it? Well, we all got a little kick. No, not in not 1993. Sorry. Not when I was 30, 40 years old. 19 so a year later they had they had gone back to rebaptize me. Oh, with okay. My, with the name because remember <laughs> I, I wasn't legally theirs until a year later. Oh. Right, cuz it takes a while to to Yes. Uh, yeah. So I was able to uh find that there she said but your name's Kevin Barheit, right? And I said, yes. And she said, well, I have a record for that, but it's in 1963. And I'd learned one of the keys of searching is let them talk. Yeah. Just be quiet, be very quiet. And so I said, mm-hmm. <laughs> and she said, but it points to another record. And I said, oh, I just got real quiet. And she said, oh, that interesting. that's right. <laughs> <laughs> we just, you know, we got to do what you got to do. And she said, uh, that's got a different name on it. And I said, oh, and she said, that name is Stephen Michael. Now, just to give you a little background on that, my adoptive father said, he had told me a little hint, that's what gave me the hint to go try to do this, that he said, when we have had you baptized, I think you you already had a name, and I think your name might have been Stephen or Michael. So oh, I Stephen had a hint, Michael. Mm -hmm. right, didn't know. So she said, do the here here here's my question though, because having seen all my birth records, and there was like correspondence between you know when 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 a couple is adopting a baby, they know at least in my case there was my all of the information my parents had. I don't know why they never told me, but there my name was clear, my birth name was clearly there, my birth mother's correspondence between the lawyer and the adoption agency so i i wonder if this is the case for other adoptive parents it's it could it could be i will tell you another part of the story in a second because it's the title of the book and there's a reason that it's titled that way i'll tell you why in a second and that'll maybe clear up that question for you the next thing i said to this woman when i was asking her she said your name you know it says Stephen Michael and I waited and I paused and I said is there a surname and she said yes but I can't pronounce it so I'll have to spell it for you <laughs> and I'm like grabbing a pen and really w-a-g-u-e-s-p-a-c-k whack us back <laughs> now I had a name and that's how I got I was assuming hoping that that was my mother's maiden name they had so I don't know if she was there. I don't know, but I'm sure that she named me. The reason I'm sure is because time went on and I had, you know, that information. I had a last name, but I didn't have her first name now. Right. I still needed her first name. So I went to Catholic Family Charities and I connected with a woman named Mary, who was the part-time archivist, very sweet little old lady. And I just about got on my knees and asked her to pray with me. I mean, I sweet talked, we, we bonded, I did everything. And uh, I said, listen, I don't need my mother's last name. I, I'm not trying to look for her. I said, I just wish I knew her first name so I could have someone to pray <laughs> to at night. I'm sorry I did all that. You're I know good. it sounds so silly. I, I don't. Know, she, you're not getting any judgment from me. No, I'm like, <laughs> I think, I think these, these privacy laws were are, are just okay. awful. So, so, awful. So, yeah. so she said to me, I'm sorry, Kevin, I, I can't give you, you know, the name. I'm sorry. Mm. So I was there for an hour. Now, this is the key to the name of the book. And I finally said to her, I said, geez, I got to get going here. I said, one more time, Kevin, try one more time. And I said, you know, Mary, is there any way you could help me? Can you give me my mother's, you know, my mother's, um, you know, first name? And she looked at me and she said, oh, Kevin, I'm so sorry. I can't give you your real first name. She had been mishearing me the entire hour. She thought I was asking for my first mm. name. And I stopped dead in my tracks and I looked at her and I said, oh, well, my name was Stephen Michael. And you could see it was like, like, a, like somebody just hit her in the face. And I said, oh, I've always known my name was Stephen Michael. My father told me my name was Stephen Michael. And she stood up, literally stood up and said, I, I'm sorry, you have to step out of the room and I have to close the door. I have to make a phone call. Now, huh? I could tell she was flustered. Now, there's an old house in Albany, so it's got rickety doors. So I stood right next to the door and listened, and I could only hear one side of the phone call. And all I heard was her talking to someone. Then I heard her say, 
He knows his name is Stephen Michael. The letter says, dear Stephen Michael, can I give him the letter? Oh. That's what I heard through the door now. Another few minutes goes by and she keeps that side of the conversation going. And finally, I hear her hang up and I bounce back from the door. She opens the door and stands right there and almost stoically just said, you know, I'm sorry, Kevin, there's nothing else I can do for you. So she had obviously called legal or that somebody. That makes me so said, no. mad. That makes I me know. so mad. But here's the trip of the story. I had to go to a job interview that day. So I just left. I said, okay, thank you. Sorry, Mary. You know, thanks. I'll go. And at that point I was just exhausted. So I, I gave it a break. About three weeks later, I called back just to try to follow up and see if I could get anywhere with this letter, because it's the only thing in my mind at that point. And Mary, uh, Mary's number just rings and rings and rings. And I finally give up and I finally call the main number. Mary died. Oh. Mm. She had a heart attack after breakfast. So at that point, I said, what, is God trying to tell me something here, you know, give up? So I gave it another week. And then I called someone else at a different agency. Her name was Sister Sharla, who had been the one who pointed me to Mary. And I asked her to meet with me, and she did. And I said, Sister, I said, I'm really sorry about your loss with Mary. And I said, but I, I, I was told that there's a letter, and I want, a, I want my letter. And she said, Kevin, let me get back to you. And she made a few phone calls, got back to me. And she called me over, and I went back over to her office. And I said, uh, and I'm ready to like, you know, lawyers, guns, and money. I want that letter. And the first thing she said to me, she says, Kevin, there is a letter. And I said, well, good. She said, but I can't give it to you. Oh, my God. I know, but there's a reason. And, I, and I'm ready to really fight her. And she said, I can't give you the letter, Kevin, because it's not addressed to you. It's addressed to your adoptive mother. The, the letter didn't say, Dear Stephen Michael. It said, Dear Stephen Michael's mother. It was a letter, mm. two-page, handwritten letter from my biological mother, mm. from my birth mother, to whoever was going to adopt me. So you asked me, where was the correspondence? Why, why didn't my parents know more? My mother and father, my adoptive parents had never gotten that letter. It sat that in a file. It makes me so for, sad. That's the truth. I mean, you're giving away your baby, you're writing a letter please take care of my baby, blah, blah, blah. And nobody gets it. It's heartbreaking to me. Nobody gets it. I finally have it. I have it. Yes. Yes. I do finally have that letter. And um, it was the only and closest correspondence I ever got from my mother. And of course it wasn't to me, yeah. but it was about me and it was for me in many ways. She said things in that letter that just, you know, uh, I, you know, things like, I want you to know that I am not an evil person. Mm. Oh, she had I so have, much shame. They made her feel so bad, you know. I have done a terrible thing and I, I am and will continue to pay for it. A, a terrible thing by doing yeah. the most natural thing in the world, which is yeah. having sex. I mean, you know, yeah. baby. And getting pregnant. I mean, um, making, yeah, the making of me, right? As they say, yeah. the making of me. Um, was a sender. So did so did you find out she wasn't alive or something? Um so I took that information, wag us back, and now I had her I, I had an I you know an idea of who she was, but uh, with the last name that allowed me to go to the next step, which was try to find the birth records because I knew the day I was born, I knew the hospital I was born, and now I knew a last name. So let and me just um, ask you something real quick, because this was 2005, correct? 2000, between 2005 and 2007. So did, did you not use the internet to look her up? Like, I tried. There was, um, I didn't have a first name. Remember, I still didn't have mm -hmm. a first name. And you so didn't know wag, that it was, she was from New Orleans yet? No, had no idea. But the wag, okay. I, I did, I was, I was able to narrow down that a majority of the Waggus backs were from certain areas like Missouri, like, you know, um, Kansas City, like New Orleans, mm -hmm. uh, it's a but it's a very widespread popular name. So I didn't know when she was born. I didn't know when she died. I didn't know that she had died. All I knew was the mm. day that she gave birth to me and I had a last name and with such sparse information that I could be there for a long time without the mm -hmm. first name. And that's what I was hoping to get from Mary was the first name, which I never got. But I did have the, you know, the last name, the date of birth and the hospital. And I was able to get someone to help me get those records from the hospital. And that's when I got her first name, which is Elizabeth. She goes by Betty Ann. Mm -hmm. I was also Betty able Ann. to get her social, yeah, I was also able to get her social, social security number. 
Mm. which then allowed us to find out, of course, sadly, yeah. that she was in the Social Security Death Index. Oh, when, when did she die? How old was she when she passed? She died on the 4th of July, 1997. Oh, yeah. So she was she, yeah. in her 50s? She was in her 50s. Mm. She was in her 50s. Mm. What did um, she die of? My mother was uh, had married, not my father, but... Um, uh, her husband, and they were coming back from a 4th of July picnic with their friends. And they had a head on collision with oh. a bridge, bridge ab um, ab abutment. And oh. uh, she died instantly. Gosh. Uh, he, her husband, Buck, uh, her husband uh, uh, went into a coma. Um, when he came out of the coma, he was blind, never regained his sight. Now, I didn't know all that. These are pieces I put together. Mm -hmm. But of course, when I found out that she had died, I found an obituary. It was a rather, you know, formal one, but a, you know, regular obituary. Didn't say how she died, but when she died and gave a bunch of information. Three years later, there was another obituary that I was able to find, which was her husband's obituary. That mm -hmm. was very short. There was not much to it. Just date, time, and I don't even think that a service. Did they have Three children out, together? They did. So you have siblings. Um, I, have, I do. <laughs> I know you you have a way of telling your story. We also do interject and ask questions. Hopefully that's okay. I'm really happy that you do. You're, because you're getting, I, I can tell you're no, getting I'm, thrown I'm, when I ask something. No, it's not I, throwing I love how ex, I, I love how excited you are about the siblings. <laughs> I know. I want to hear about them. Uh -huh. Okay, well, excited. go on. <laughs> also, I'm going to see I'm going to see them on um, Friday. Oh. oh, yay. Okay. I figured the so, way you were so excited, like, you know, you're an only child and you're just, your face lit up. The information of knowing that my, I know, I know that's, well, John, J John, Julie, and James, those mm -hmm. are my three sibs. And um, I'm the oldest of the four though. Um, <laughs> and um, yeah, when I found out that my, my mother had passed, of course, I mean, I, I keep, you, you know how that had to feel, right? I mean, I was just on mm -hmm. the floor and I didn't know how to function, but I also had an obituary, right? And that obituary listed my siblings. And I just, I had not allowed myself to fantasize, imagine during the search. And I think that was really healthy because it just kept me open and very present. And I learned a lot about how important it is for me to be ready, to get ready. It's yeah. not just getting ready to meet someone. No. It's getting ready physically, emotionally, mentally, and spiritually, so to speak. This is um, so, this is so what adoptees don't have is a guide how to do that right we talk about it all the time you go into reunion and head on and it's a you know having it's good for people to hear that you know get yourself ready for that what's coming staying present yeah i think maybe more maybe more prevalent now no uh -huh. there's more resources than there was when uh -huh. you know i'm time, so grateful but... for people like Roz who helped me and then the, the search angels i had and one of the most important ones was a, a name a, a fellow named michael luck and michael was one of the only first adoptees that i met who had actually reunited with his family so much that i gleaned from him of course through his trials and errors but also he had been helped by some search angels and so mm -hmm. when we can talk like this when we can share like this when we can pass it on and expose each other to these stories and these understandings it's you know there's no perfect way to do this no i mean do i wish that i had done it many many years before of course because then maybe they'd be alive right, right. maybe i would have met my mother but that's my story and i have to you know piece it together the best i can and the puzzle pieces slowly came together having uh go ahead uh, so your mom recently passed, you told us. My, she, adop my adopted, adopted mom, yeah. mom. Did she ever see the letter? Yeah, what ended up happening was they wouldn't give me the letter, remember? Mm -hmm. And right. so I had, so that, that day I raced over to my, my mother's house uh, where I was raised. And I said, I need you to write this. I had typed it up already. I said, I need you to sign this and we have to get it notarized. And I put it in an envelope and um, we sent it off. And I was hoping that my mother would have gotten that and then would have just called me so I could be the one to open it. But she got it and she opened it. Of course. And um, she read it and um, it was devastating for her. You know what hurt her more than anything, which was sad, was knowing that my mother had died. And that I had never gotten a chance. She was just 
so brokenhearted for both me and my mm. my biological mother. My I, adoptive mom was really had a heart for that. Had a really deep deep sadness for me and and my family that I never got to have. Right? I like that. Um, you know, from their era that they that they felt that way. They helped you and cared and. You know, that's, that's not the norm sometimes. And no, and it wasn't was your, easy for them. Your father, mm-hmm. um, was he well, still alive at that point? Or is- he was, I remember sitting at the dining room table talking, like when I literally told them here, here's because, you know, getting the letter was one thing, but that didn't mean much, right? It was a letter, but no real information. But when I finally found, I gave it a few days, I, I found my mother had passed away. And then I had to reach out to my siblings. That's another long, wonderful story. But I finally reached out to my siblings and eventually started to get a couple of pictures. My brother and my sister, they sent pictures of you know them, of course, of my nieces and nephews and of my mm. mother. And I, I'll never forget. It's actually on the cover of the book is yeah. the first picture I ever got from them of my mother. It's so beautiful. And it's those are actually both my mothers on the, on the, on the front is my biological and my adoptive mom. But I remember coming to my mom and dad's to the house, sitting down at the table and then, you know, handing them pictures. And I remember my mother just sobbing and just crying and, you know, just it it just hurt so much. How did my dad feel about it? It was interesting because he's a great guy. And, you know, he he my mom, my 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 mom was kind of more of the stoic one in the family my adoptive mom was more you know the rock the you know the, the family and my dad was definitely more emotional um i got a lot of my my care my traits i think from him and uh so he didn't know what to do he was kind of a little bit of a not a basket case but he was a little unnerved by the whole moment but i remember he did ask me do you know who your dad is and mm-hmm. i said no, i was gonna I ask know. you that too <laughs> i said no i don't know because my mom's dead and nobody's nobody knows nobody knows she was you- it went to have you done DNA and all of that? Funny you should ask. <laughs> um, yes. And now do you know who your father is? Yes, I know my entire history at this point. Have you okay, so the next question, have you met them or is it still just knowing who who he is? And you know this wonderful story that I just told you about mm-hmm. the sadness of finding my biological mother passed away and then the glory, as you can tell, my mm-hmm. real tickled about having brothers and a sister and my mm-hmm. family. They're just, we're just so close and it's so easy. Mm-hmm. Everything about finding her was traumatic and disappointing and sad, but everything that happened after that just has just enhanced my life. It was, I'm not going to say it was easy, but it was magical. Yeah. It really, really was finding them. Um, my mother had moved to Colorado. I found her, you know, I went to her grave. That was extremely hard, but, but all my, my brothers and my sister are in Colorado and we're all very close. I love them very much and they love me and I'm going to see them again. Uh, we were just there. I was just there last year. trying to see them as often as I can. During after, right after the book was published, um, we, and it was published during COVID, unfortunately during the pandemic, I was home a lot. I was sitting on this computer, actually, I don't know, maybe just bored one day. And I somehow ancestry came up in my, in my mind and I sent away and spit and did it. And I came back with information and it was one of two brothers. After I did all my research, it seemed to be one of two brothers. One was dead. One was alive. And so I reached out to everyone that I could and connected. It was a niece, I believe, or somebody. Yeah, it was one of my nieces, I think, that um, had been an ancestry, which allowed me to do everything else. And they all have ghosted me. Every one of them have ghosted me. Yeah. So I got, it took me about six months to finally give up, not give up, but just finally say, I can't keep going right now. And maybe this is the way it's supposed to be. Well, I don't know what came of me, but, you know, came over me, but, um, a few months later, I decided to do 23 and Me, and I found a sister. And it start, I was only doing 23 and Me, not even hoping to find anyone anymore. I just wanted to have some kind of medical information for mm-hmm. me, for my, for my, I have two, two sons and two daughters, and I wanted to be able to give them as much as I could. Yeah. And I found a sister, and I reached out to her. And all it said was Patricia, and that's it. Didn't have a last name, didn't have anything. So this is kind of a long story, but I'm going to really put it in a little nutshell for you. Mm -hmm. I found out who she was. She connected with me and found out who I was. Then she ghosted me for two months. Mm -hmm. She she panicked. 
And then two months later, I got the message. You know, I'm really sorry that I, you know, ghosted you. Uh, her husband is adopted too. So she finally realized, she said, you know what, if somebody was, if he was reaching out, trying to find his family, I would want people to be receptive to him. So I'm willing to talk to you, but how can I help you? I don't know. And I said, look, I know we don't have the same mom, but that would mean we had the same dad. Would you mind telling me who your father was? And she did. And she said, but don't let him know that I gave you the number. So he's alive. He was the alive one. Hold on. Hold on. It does. <laughs> it's never that simple, right? No. Hold on. So she said, please don't tell him who I am or that I gave him the, the information because we don't talk. We haven't talked for 12 oh. years. So I took his name, I got his information, and I, I've got a lot of resources now to help me put all the pieces together. He's not my father. Ah. He's not her father either. Oh. Yeah. There you go. She her didn't know mother, that? No. Uh -huh. Her mother, her mother was uh -huh. married to him and had her older sister, right? So she has an older sister. So her mother's married, was married to him, had the older sister, then had left him right? They had split. Then the story goes, the story she was always told is they got back together. She got pregnant, right? With her. And then she split again from him. And that's not oh. the truth. That's so, not the truth. All right. So she's not your sister. <laughs> she is my sister. Oh, we she are, is your sister. You just we, don't. Oh, she doesn't she's know. not I'm that guy. You, if, if, you, if you'll <laughs> stick with me, if you'll stick with me, this is one okay. of the, like I said, how easy was I it? I have some other go? questions about other things. So yes. I'm so I so, found, I found her. Then I found another cousin. Then through that cousin, I found that I had a different sister. So I've got two half sisters that none of us know each other because our biological father was married twice, had two biological uh, children in within marriage, but had all three of us through affairs. He was a cheater. Well, he, he was a guy. He was a busy I, man. I, 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 yes, I try not to judge here. This is too crazy. Not judge, story. Okay, yeah, right? I'll he strike that from the record. Oh, the first thing. Of, so, I'll first say thing, he was my a cheater. Come on. All right. No, yeah, well, he was. But but I will say this: that through one of those sisters, she grew up knowing him, but she didn't know he was his father. So oh, here's goodness. the story, though. When I found my biological sister, right, the one through twenty three and me, yeah, and we finally started like connecting over all this. Her, her mother, her mother was, had cancer. So I found her at one of the worst times in her life, mm. right? When I found my other sister, and, and this is the one that actually knew our father that grew up knowing him and then did a DNA test with him later, right? Because she found out mm -hmm. who, when she was 16, she said, wow. why are you so nice to me? I think I'm your father. Let's do D So I've got DNA. All this stuff is crazy. She had just lost her son from an overdose a oh, month before. Oh man. I found both my siblings during tragedy. Tragedy, loss, what we call him, um, you know, uh, anticipatory grief, uh, you know, pure grief, which he's still oh. grieving. It's been several years now since, you know, she lost him. But I've talked to them both, I've connected with them both. The problem is that because there was so much and then my mother just died this past year, right? Yes. I mean, you right. know, we've yeah, had a own. lot of, yeah, th a lot this of... has been, yeah. So I found my mother, but she was deceased. I found my father, but she was, he was deceased, right? So I've never, he, I didn't know the, there was one that was alive, one that was not alive. Unfortunately, the one that had passed away was my father. And, yeah. you know, we did that all through DNA, you know, but it was the, almost the, the, the luck, the luck of some fate right. that my one sister had done a DNA test with him and then I tested with her and then I tested with my, you know, it was all these things, but so I also, isn't it? I was yes. also put, I was also put to, able to put together a hundred other clues, right? Because it's all the clues. It's really been quite horrendously hard and complex, but I'm so glad, you know, I'm still healing from all that. It's really been imagine. hard for me. This is I the do. first con I stopped interviewing because it was too hard. This is the well, first you're just I've going done. through grieving, right? With your, yeah. I do. Yeah. I have a, I have a question though, because we've talked a lot about your very detailed search and mm -hmm. all that stuff, but we haven't at all talked about your childhood That's and what, what that was, was like for you. Um, it's mm -hmm. searching is one thing, and you've got to. You're in mm -hmm. reunion, but but back up and just give a little bit of insight into like what you felt about 
being adopted and, and where that, and you were an only child. So there must've been some loneliness and. There was an incredible story behind that, of course. And that's why I wrote the book. The book goes through both of those stories, the search and the finding and everything I just told you, mm -hmm. but also what happened after I was adopted. And, uh, you know, the first say nine years of my life were rather just like a normal kid. I was this only child being raised by two loving parents, you know, so to speak. And, um, uh, but unfortunately, when I was nine, I was uh, was molested, not by mm -hmm. my by, not by my adoptive family, but by mm -hmm. a, a stranger, well, an, an, an authority figure, let's just say. Uh, yeah. And so I was I was molested, and I think at that point, uh, you know, there was just so many pieces that were already kind of off kilter with me, knowing that I was adopted, knowing that, mm -hmm. you know, the, it's yeah. called ambiguous. It's called ambiguous loss, if no one knows that phrase. But there's an understanding when you're very young that something's yeah. missing something's mm -hmm. missing yeah and it's the physical presence of anyone that looks and knows you looks like you or knows you and but they're all in here always yeah. in your mind always in my heart like it's always every heartbeat is like where are you where are you where are you but then when i and i think maybe if that had been the only thing that had um you know been a part of my uh, traumas, uh, maybe I would have been able to navigate that. And then the, the molestation really, I think was the part that broke. Mm -hmm. It yeah. just breaks. Yeah. Terrible. I'm sorry that happened to you. you. That's just a really, it just shapes your it entire does. world. And I'm really happy to hear you're married and have four kids and yeah. I mean that, that you have joy and love in your life. Cause it really could have gone another, another way, right? I mean, it could have. And I think that's what the point is, is like when I started to really struggle, unfortunately, like like some, and I would yeah. say in some ways, many of us, I, I became dependent on uh, alcohol and drugs uh, at a very young age. And that kept happening. I was 11 when I had my first drink. I was 12 when I had my Me first too. overdose, you know? Yeah. So things just really do uh, piece together like that. I was uh. taken, I was taken out of my uh, adoptive family's home and put back into foster care. Uh. Uh, yeah. You know, it, it was one of those stories and the first foster family was rough. It wasn't easy. There was some abuse there, but the second one was much, much more abusive and was, um, you know, full of drugs, alcohol and, and wow. um, phys physical abuse. But then after that, I ended up, I ran away, you know, and lived on the streets for a bit and then ended up in a group home. And from the group home, I went to a detention center. And then by the time I'm 16, they actually placed me back with my adoptive family. But by then, and this is the way I phrase it because it makes sense to me. It was like going back to a country where you forgot the language. Yes. You know, it was like, yeah. I, I don't know how, I don't know who you are. I don't know. None of this makes sense anymore. And I went off the rails. Um, things got really bad for quite a long time. And that's some of the horror stories that happen to uh, folks that struggle you know, right. with with yeah. with these areas of their lives, with the abandonment, with the confusion of, of sense of self. And I, I didn't have low self-esteem. I had, you know, it was on the minus scale. Me it too. Was, yeah. I had I had a terrible teenage years myself, so I, I can empathize with you and know exactly what you're talking about. I had, I, a, up, I had a friend recently tell me I, I went through a molestation with a neighbor next door and she's a therapist and she said, well, you were a target. You're an easy target because of the ambiguous thing you just mentioned. And I never thought about that. You know, she said people can sense it. Um, my, you know, there's a story I very rarely ever talk about except in personal uh, relations, but I think it's important, especially now that my mom is gone, I feel a little bit more open about, you know, saying things, mm -hmm. but all her life, she knew, you know, I, I, when she, when I was a kid and this happened, she, no one knew, you know, pedophiles, I hate to say it out loud, but they're very good at what they do. Many they times. And so nobody knew about it. And then when I finally, I didn't even know. I knew that it, it had happened, but I didn't identify it as molestation. I knew I had been raped when I was a teenager, but I didn't identify it as rape. Mm. I just I just thought this is what adults do with children. I didn't have any understanding. Mm. Oh. And then when I was an adult and finally got sober, I got sober when I was 23 and you know went into the 12 steps and started to get my life together, but I wasn't okay. As a matter of fact, without the drugs and alcohol to anesthetize that myself, mm -hmm. it was worse. I was I was off yeah. the off the off the rails. But I finally started to piece that together. And it was really incredibly important for me to recognize that it wasn't my fault. 
that that yeah. wasn't something that I had lined myself up for. Um, and that's what people not. say, well, you know, what were you wearing or how did you act and things like that. Mm -hmm. yeah. But when, when I finally got an understanding of what had happened to me, I did tell my mother and my father about it. And it took them, I don't think my dad ever reconciled with it. They yeah. never, they said, oh, that doesn't sound like, I don't, you know, they doubted. They couldn't do it in their head. No. But then, but then after, after the book came out, actually, my mother who was living with me at the time, she was 91 at the time, 91, 92. I was helping her in her bedroom. We had a nice little apartment for her and I was helping her do something, put clothes away or something out of nowhere. She just said it. She said, so when, when, when that guy hurt you when you were little, what, what, what happened? And she, I could tell it was one of those moments. I was so glad that I had done all these years of healing because I could be very present for that. Mm -hmm. And I was able to say, you mean when he molested me? And she said, yeah. And I knew I could see that was so hard for her. And I talked to her and I said, well, I said, before I tell you what happened, let me just tell you the first thing I need to say. It's, it's not your fault. And I could just, you know, the tears started to come. And I said, well, let me tell you something else. I said, I'm okay. I'm okay. She said, okay. And then we, this is of course, you know, a very emotional yeah. moment. And then I told my mother and I could just to this day, I can't tell you how much it meant to me to, to watch able. her. Yeah. To watch her be able to finally hold it and be able to say, you know, this happened to my mm -hmm. son and she cried and she said, I, I, I can't believe this happened. I'm so, it was because she couldn't protect me. Yeah. Right. She just didn't know what to do with that. But if we take those little steps, I can't believe so many things have gone wrong in my life. I also can't believe so many things have now gone right in my life. Right. Mm -hmm. I can't believe that I don't have my biological mother and on this earth and I'll never meet her. I can't believe I have, you know, all these siblings and oh my gosh, it's so right. crazy and complicated. It's and both. Mm -hmm. It's, it's both. It's and not, you know, not, or it's and so. Wow. Kevin, this has been so oh. incredible. And and thank you for us being your first interview. We feel honored that you, that you've chosen oh, yeah. that. And I know you're, you know, there's a lot of grief, but also yeah. a lot of joy, you know, life is. This is important right. for, for so many to hear too, because there's a lot of people that have gone through things that don't speak out and hearing this, you know, in their car driving, whatever. I think about that, like healing. It's very, it's, I, I'm just impressed how much you shared with us. Thank you. Well, I thank you. I didn't know if I could do it or would do it. I honestly, if you'd asked me even just a month ago, I might have said I'm not ready. And um, the, I, I know who both of you are. We haven't gotten personally connected in any way, shape or form, but I know your work and I know your generosity and it meant a lot to me. So you're right. The only reason I do this and the only reason we do this is because we know that when we hear these stories, mm -hmm. how much it helps and heals and guides us. Yes. So, I'm not going to, you know, I, I may not have been ready for these last year or two, right? Because it's, and these are just, you know, some of this, we're just not glossing over, but we're skimming over some of the real deep stuff. There's been mm -hmm. a lot more pain uh, that, you know, I've talked about in other, in other podcasts in the past about, you know, um, despair and yeah. you know, depression, mm -hmm. and suicidal thoughts and all the things that we grapple with at times, but we're here. And yeah. that's yes. why I came, that's why I came today. We're here. I feel like your children are just, you're just such a neat man. And and for to be so honest about your own life is really guiding for your children. They may be older and grown, but it's, you know, it's, it's really neat. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you. Oh, Kevin. oh okay, you. by the way, please tell um, our listeners where, and we'll put it in our show notes, but where, yes. where to find you and where to get your book. Sure. Well, the easiest way to find me is at kevinbarheight.com. And of course, it's a different spelling. So you'll have to go in the show notes to get it, but kevinbarheight.com. <laughs> and also, uh, if you just go into Amazon and type in Kevin Barheight, uh, that'll lead you to St Dear Stephen Michael's Mother. Uh, and then there's the YouTube channel, which um, again, during all this uh, searching, I haven't really been able to spend as much time on it as I wanted to. Um, it's just been a little hard to revisit it, but there's a whole lot of content that's there from oh, uh, look. The, yeah. the several years that I that I, that I I worked on it. So thank you so much. Thank that's you. Thank we, we, you. We would like a book because we're starting an adoptive memoir library ourselves. I just got a new batch. They're sitting literally all piled up. Yeah. Okay. 
great. Yeah, yeah we'll you, give. Yes, we'll send yeah, you our addresses. Yeah, yeah email you your address. Can I just? We, and I'll yeah. just Can I sign it for you? And yeah, absolutely. Would love that. Yes. 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 Awesome. And um, enjoy your turkey today. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He's having our an early, early Thanksgiving. Early Thanksgiving should be a real hoot. Yeah. Take that so out. <laughs> wish me well. Wish me well. Oh. I do all the co- I do all the cooking, so I'm going to be exhausted and by about six o'clock tonight. But I really, it's a good exhausted. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. All right. Kevin. Thank you, Kevin. Bye-bye. Good to see you both. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye.